Are you looking to learn more about investing in the central Indiana real estate market? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Indie Real Estate Investing Podcast with TNH Realty, where we discuss all things related to investing in the central Indiana real estate market. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Indie Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Tallman with TNH Realty. We are a residential property management company that services the central Indiana market. Today's guest is Cherie Clark. Cherie is a loan consultant with Longhorn Investment Group. Welcome to the show, Cherie. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Sure. So I thought it made sense um, to bring you on this month's show because, you know, let's face it, interest rates are a little wacky right now. Um, I'm in contact with our brokerage routinely, and they tell me that buyers are just not happy with these interest rates. I even heard last week that it's almost impossible to get a traditional loan for a multifamily property. They kind of price those products out. Um, I'm sure I'm sure that's not the case in, for every lender, but it's just the bottom line is it's hard to get money now. People are uneasy about going to a bank and getting money because they're having some sticker shock on some of these interest rates. So thought it makes sense to bring you on, talk about another an alternative for investors um, to use hard money. So yeah, I thought it made sense to kind of bring you on and, and talk about that. So before we get too deep into this, tell us about you, your background, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis regarding hard money. Well, uh, I started with Longhorn back in 2017. Um, mm -hmm. I was an investor with my mom and we were, yeah, we, we were kind of lost as most people are when they go to those real estate meetups. And then I met one of the executive uh, the executives of Longhorn, they were looking for somebody local to, you know, be their boots on the ground here. So that's, that's kind of how I got my start. Since then, I've stopped investing because I've been so busy doing the hard money thing that, yeah, I just didn't have the capacity to do investing anymore. Eventually, I'll like to do it. But right now, I like what I do. Okay. So you were an investor. So what, I'm curious, tell me what you did regarding investing. And uh, what, what meetups did you go to? Oh, I went to Fortune Builders with my mom and mm -hmm. I went to Syria, which is the Central Indiana Real Estate uh, Investors Association, mm -hmm. uh, which is where I met Longhorn. And, um, and we went to various boot camps, you know, as you do mm -hmm. <laughs> as a new investor. Um, but <clears throat> eventually when we got our start, I helped her coordinate with contractors and I would go to Lowe's and Home Depot and, you know, Menards and price out materials, like all the fun stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So in full disclosure, Sheree, I know very little about hard money lending. Um, you know, before I decided to bring you on, we've, Scott and I did a one, I think hard money deal a long time ago. Back then, I don't remember there being like companies that did hard money. Maybe there were, I just, you know, may not have known about them, but there was a guy in town that did hard money lending and he was just an individual. So you met him and he kind of felt you out and he loaned you money if he wanted to, looked at the product, obviously. Yeah. And I think we did one deal with him. It helped us out. You know, we got, we got the deal done. I think we still actually maybe own the property if I'm thinking about the right home. Um, and then there's another friend of ours, investing friend of ours that did it for a little bit, but doesn't anymore. So you are actually are a company that does it, yeah. um, which I'm, you know, it's, and I kind of knew just being in this industry and hearing about it, that there were companies formed and, and they're doing this thing. So kind of tell me how it works. Like if I find myself and I'm not real thrilled with what I see from, you know, whatever bank I normally work with or get my money from for, for properties. And I say, you know, I want to come on a call, uh, Sheree at Longhorn. What, what, tell me how, how it works. Like, what do I do to, to, to engage your services? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, just to go back to what you were talking about with individuals being hard money lenders, like that's totally, I mean, that's not shocking to me because mm -hmm. hard money is basically private money. It's just how you structure the loan. Right. So hard money is based on the hard asset, which is the property. So for most hard money lenders, we're not looking at tax returns. We're not looking to verify income. We're just looking to see that you have reserves, like so cash in the bank and, you know, a minimum score of 650 of credit score. I'm um, just, you know, for our leveraging abilities as well for, with our bank. Um, but yeah, we, we, 
we're a fix and flip and short-term loan for rehabbing for the purpose of rentals. So Mm -hmm. we do flips, we do rentals. Uh, We just started delving into the new construction world. So that's really exciting as well. But to get pre-approved with a hard money lender, like I said, you'd want to make sure that you've at least got good credit. So 650 is our minimum. Okay. And cash in the bank, which typically we want to see around 15,000, but it really depends on the rehab or the the scope of work that you've got put together. Hopefully you've got put together. Yeah, it's really easy. It's quick. Uh, we could do a same day pre-approval. We can close within five business days. And I think that's the luxury of using a hard money lender because you're not having to jump through hoops like you would with a conventional loan. Right. right. Like you're just doing a very simple uh, yeah, credit check and you're submitting bank statements to me. Gotcha. Okay. So I come to you and I say, I've got this property. It's distressed. Um, You know, and I don't know if you're going to take my word for it, but I say, hey, I can buy this home for a hundred thousand. And if I put 50 into it, it'll be worth 250,000. So that's, that's, you know, on paper, it pencils out to be a pretty good deal. But you're still going to do your due diligence. You're going to look at the property, but you're also going to look at me at a certain level, right? I can't just be destitute and just say I I have hard work as my, you know, my one attribute and and no no other assets. Both the property and myself have to qualify at a certain level. Yes, absolutely. So it's it's minimal that we look at on the individual level. Like I said, we just look at credit and and uh, cash in the bank. But as far as the property, we're we we delve into that way more. Mm-hmm. We're going to look, we're going to send an appraiser out. We're going to make sure that your scope of work makes sense to make sure that you get the ARV or the after repair value that you're looking at, which is also known as your comps. Right. And we base okay. the loan on the, uh, the ARV or the after repair value. So we lend up to 70% of the ARV or 75%, depending on what your exit strategy is. Okay, good. So the burning question here is it's, 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 you mentioned it's fast. It's it's quick. I don't have to, again, jump through all these hoops that a normal conventional financing would require me to do. Um, but what's it cost me? Yeah. So uh, our pricing is, I think it's pretty good. It's competitive. We charge 12.99% interest only, which it seems high, but it's also a short-term loan. And then we charge three points at closing, which is uh, your origination fee. So 3% of the total loan amount. Okay. So you do that. And then how long do I have if, you know, if I'm doing a, like a fix and flip, how long do I have to pay you back? You've got, six, yeah, you've got six months. That's the starting note. And then you have the option to extend if you need more time. Okay, good. So, it, you know, six months should be enough time. For most, I think flips. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Scott and I would agree with all that totally. We've we've had some go a lot longer than that, but we've had some go really quick, right? That we can just it's paint, it's carpet or flooring or whatever, and then and then then you go. Um, so if I wanted to go more than six months, is it six months increments based on what's happening, or how does that work? Uh, it's three months, so uh, we we do one point, so one additional point, so one percent of the total loan amount, and that equals three months. Okay, so you just pay for more time, basically. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what are the pros and cons of this? And, and, you know, if, wh- why would someone resort to hard money? I mean, you talked about that a little bit, but what are your customers telling you? Like, and, and maybe you could give me a, like a profile of a typical customer of yours, like, you know, and, and maybe there's not one, but some examples of clients that come to you that have chosen not to use conventional financing for, for whatever reason. Oh, yeah. I think it depends on, you know, how much money you're willing to put into the deal. You know, hard money is really good for leveraging your capital. So let's say you have 15,000 in the bank. I mean, we could do, we could do pretty big deals with that amount of cash. I mean, that we want to see that amount of cash because we want to make sure that you can close the deal. So pay closing fees and title fees and insurance, Mm -hmm. then also start the rehab. Because most hard money lenders are not going to give you your entire rehab escrow at closing. We're going to hold back and you're going to request draws and we'll send an inspector out, which is also a safety measure for you as an investor. Mm -hmm. We're making sure that your contractor is not just taking your money or our money and just, you know, leaving (laughs) in the middle of the project. Yeah. Right. Still happens every once in a while, but you know, it's our safety measure too. Gotcha. Okay. So we've, we have worked with hard money lenders in, in terms of our property management and our 
let's say rehab or construction or make ready, whatever term you want to use where, and it could have been with you for all I know. I don't, I don't know that answer, but, um, and we had that same thing where, you know, we had to be more, I guess, intentional in how we did the billing. And then we'd say, okay, the inspector's going out and now we get the, the, the investors like, Hey, now I get all this funding and I can make a contribution to pay the vendors. Right. So there is, and I do like what you brought up there is it do provide, does provide the investor some safeguards that they're not just taking our word for it. They're going to have an independent person go out and say, yeah, this is done, whatever that, whatever this is uh, to, conf- so you guys feel comfortable about releasing funds. So you do do draws for construction and things like that. We do. Yes. Yes. Okay. So tell me, um, about the products. I'm curious about the products. You talked about that a little bit, but the different products you'll finance. Um, Let's start with multifamily. Will you do multifamily buildings? We do up to four units, anything after four, and it's more of a case by case basis. We'll just have to take a look at the deal and see if it makes sense. Okay. So you do, you will go, but you know, the one to four family type thing is something you do, I guess, routinely. Uh, You talked about fix and flips. What about, um, and you talked about new construction, which I think is interesting, but what about vacant lots? Oh, we don't really, yeah, we don't really That's do. Not your thing. It depends like what your plans are, right? Like we, we need to make sure like, are you going to build on this lot? Are you going to do an, a, a property? And if so, why not come to us for the new construction loan? Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So obviously, you know, real estate is, there's a lot of successes and there's failures and you know, it's just part of being a real estate investor. You're going to have ups and downs, but can you kind of go through some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen investors make from hard money? Like what, what, what do you need to know before you get into this? Right. Um, so I mentioned reserves. So ideally I want to see cash that you have reserved, right? Set aside, not just all of your money that's in your bank account. Mm -hmm. Um, so 15 ideally is the amount, um, and this is just to make sure that you're not over leveraging, which is the number one mistake that I see with investors. This is what breaks an investor is when they are asset rich and cash poor. Cause at that point they, you're going to struggle finding a refi lender. Who's not going to charge you anything, right? Mm-hmm. You have to pay points, usually interest, that kind of thing. And if you've already expended all of your cash, that's not good. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, that leads to foreclosure. It leads to a lot of different issues. And, and that's the biggest mistake that I've right. seen. It's just, just not have, okay, gotcha. All right. So you, you, you'd you you mentioned too about out-of-state investors, um, buyers relying on real estate companies as, you know, their boots on the ground, wholesalers, you know, also being their general contractors. Talk about that a little bit. I'm kind of curious, you sent me that note. What, what do you kind of explain what you're going or what you mean there about, you know, I'm assuming you're providing a, a, a different like consultative service or a different way of making sure checks and balances happen. Right. Cause it, at the end of the day, we don't want to foreclose. Well, we're not into that business, <laughs> right? We're, we're not investors. We're, we're your hard money lenders. So we, we don't want to have properties. We don't want to have to take over the rehab. We don't want to have to resell it on the back end. Um, so that's kind of where I come in. I, I try to at least be alert and help avoid those those catastrophes. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned, you know, out-of-state investors. You're vulnerable already as an investor, especially if you're new. But if you're out-of-state, you're not meeting these people face-to-face most of the time. And a lot of out-of-state investors are really, truly relying on like one or two individuals that they've never met Mm -hmm. uh, and that they've most likely not fully vetted. So they've not gotten references. They they don't know anybody else has used them. It's scary. And Mm -hmm. so from a lender, you know, from a hard money lender standpoint, I've seen a lot of people getting taken advantage of, like from actually really popular investors in the indie area. So I try to at least tell them like, look, do your due diligence, vet them, meet them in person if you can. Come to Indianapolis, meet these people. Like even have like a, a meetup where you meet all of the people that you want to like get to know. I mean, we we hold tons and tons of networking events, and I know that they're broadcasted on uh, the Facebooks. So, right, there's really no excuse, um, and especially if it's your business. 
Like if it's your business, you want to know all the players on your team. You don't want to completely rely on somebody who's just going to cut and run with your money. I mean, that that's, it's scary, but also yeah. like, so that's where I come in. Like I, I try to refer people to people that I know and I've worked with, but again, you, you still want to fully vet those people on your own. Right. And you don't, this is from experience of uh, you, you don't really want your wholesaler to also be your general contractor. There was, right. and I'm not going to name any names, but there was a wholesaler in the area who, and these were local investors that he duped. Um, he would find the deal. He'd match up, you know, his buyer, which would be my client. And he would never set foot in that property again. And he, his scope of work would be so low that my, my client, my borrower wouldn't be able to find a contractor to come in and do the work for that low of cost. Right. So they were just stuck in this very expensive hard money loan without an end in sight. So we would end up having to foreclose on those deals, which is expensive for us as a hard money lender. Mm -hmm. Right. So these were local people. Oh yeah. Just, hmm. I mean, local in terms of your buyers or your, your clients were local yeah. and they just were kind of oblivious to what it may have cost to get this property ready. Yeah. This guy was a smooth talker. I'll tell you, I talked to him a few times mm -hmm. and, and you know, he heard a lot of my friends in that way. Cause you right. know, when you go through foreclosure with us, we can't do any more deals with you. So right. you're going to find another lender. And then also you have a foreclosure, you know, yeah, that's hard. Yeah. yeah. It just completely breaks you. Yeah. No, I agree. It's, you know, we, we talk about that a lot here that, you know, our clients put an amazing amount of trust in us. You know, we don't take that for granted. We know that. Um, I've never bought a property personally more than like five miles from my office, you know, and these people, these people are buying properties, you know, 2000 miles in some cases from, from where they live. They've never seen it. They've probably never been to Indiana. Right. And, um, you know, they're looking to us to, in some cases, help them buy. And then, you know, in every case in property management, help us place tenants and do work. And it's a tremendous amount of trust and you have to um, get to know them. And also like, you know, the whole reserve thing, it's something we preach here about reserves is that, you know, when you buy a rental property, you can't just expend all your money on that asset and then not have any to maintain that asset. And too many times we talk with people that just say, I have literally no money to do work to this house. And that's a bad position to be in. Um, you know, we always talk about using January's rent to pay January's mortgage. That's a bad position to be in. So um, I would agree. Reserves are so key in so many aspects of real estate. You've got to have cushion because again, there's a lot of success in real estate, but there are failures. And when that failures happen, you don't want to foreclosure can't be your only option. You know, you got to be able to dig into some reserves if you need to. So I like that. Yeah. Another, you know, back to reserves. Another thing that personally I don't like to see is when an investor has liquidated a bunch of credit cards um, just to show me their reserves. Cause at that mm. point you're already upside down, right? Like you're not right. even using your own money to invest at this point. Yeah. And so like couple that with being out of state, not vetting your, your team here locally, it's just, it's going to be disaster. And that's another, you know, that's where I come in. I, I try to, I try to help people protect them from those kinds of mistakes. Right. So given the lending environment and just the, the real estate environment generally, have you all seen an uptick in your business calls, leads into your, into your company looking for alternatives? Oh yeah. So uh, I mean, this started in 2020. So a lot of lenders stopped lending okay, or they increased their interest in points significantly. So it, it made it a bad deal. So a lot of investors came to Longhorn. We didn't, we didn't change our rates. We were still lending. It was one of our biggest years ever. And then 2020 happened another huge year for Longhorn. And then 2022 biggest year yet. Wow. And I have not felt a slowdown at all. Um, and then, you know, a lot of hard money lenders are, are running out of money. So a lot of investors who had, you know, this beautiful working relationship with their lender are now kind of scrounging to find, you know, their new lender. So that's another reason why our business really picked up in 2022. And then, you know, as, as of what, March 9th, 2023. <laughs> right. Right. 
So give me your opinion of central Indiana of, and what are your, like, give me a peek inside of your, your clients' brains and what, what they're thinking about this market and kind of what they're doing to, because it's, it's interesting, you know, we were talking about this yesterday, actually, it's like, we still have people that are buying homes every month. Yeah. You know, and I think that's just people that are very, that have a plan that, um, you know, don't let a point or two of interest rate affect them. Maybe they find different ways of buying homes, but they have a plan and they're sticking to it. And I just like applaud them. It's like, wow, this, this person bought another property. Here's another property. You know, there's continually, they're working their plan, right? And they're not letting, you know, necessarily outside influences uh, keep them down. So what are, what are you personally thinking about, about the the market and what are your, give us again, peek inside the, the brains of your clients to, to what, how, how they're using your products to continue to build their businesses. Yeah. A lot of rentals, a lot of rental investors. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not just Indianapolis, you know, it's the entire, it's almost the entirety of Indiana. Um, yeah. A, a lot of just the same neighborhoods. You'll see them just investing in the same neighborhoods time and time again. Like just, they're building the block, right? Like, right. <laughs> basically. And uh, a lot of flips still, you know, building capital to then, you know, do their rentals, like just to leverage in time and time again, just work in that machine, feeding it. That's what I'm seeing. Right. Okay. A healthy so, mix of flips and rentals. Right. So I'm assuming that and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I would assume that most of your business is in Indianapolis, but I mean, I'm curious about that. And then where else are you seeing money going to, like in terms of markets in Indiana? Sure. Uh, you're right. Mainly it's Indianapolis and the surrounding areas. So major metro area. And then also Terre Haute, huge hmm. rental market. Uh, Fort Wayne, you know, it's coming around. It's booming. Uh, the, the healthy mix of rentals and flips there as well. Um, and then I'm trying to get us to start lending to the South Bend area because I really like that area a lot. I think it's a really good rental market. You know, around the universities is really where I like to see deals um, start popping up because that means, you know, rentals. Right, right. Are you seeing anything? I'm curious about Muncie. Uh, so it depends. So we do have, um, as far as us, like as far as Longhorn, we do have a minimum loan amount which is a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And I've seen a lot of those deals. They don't quite make the cut right? because those purchase prices are so low. And then of course, you know, the rehab, they don't need a whole lot of rehab. Right. Gotcha. So it sounds like you have a, your finger on the pulse of the market pretty well and areas pretty well. So I want to ask you, you know, you'd mentioned that you invest, which I find really interesting and you're really busy now lo- lending. And you said, you, you mentioned that you may get back into investing at some time. So if you had to buy something today and had your pick of, which is hard, you know, let's say inventory wasn't an issue and you could just say, I, I want to buy here because I think there's the most upside or, you know, best cash flow, whatever your, your goal is, where, where is uh, Cherie buying today in I, Indianapolis? Yeah. I really love the Devington neighborhood of Indianapolis. It's Northern parts, uh, West of Lawrence, Mm-hmm. Uh, near Arlington, so near Fort yeah. Bend, um, yeah. mature, beautiful neighborhoods. So people have been taking really good care of their properties. And so the rehab is very low and it's a great rental market. Okay. So Devington, that's where you would place your money as a rental. I would. Yes. Okay. Great. <laughs> well, Hey, I appreciate this. Is there, is there anything else that you want to go over that I'm, that I'm missing in terms of you know, frequently asked questions. I, <laughs> I did in preparation for this, you'll have to be proud of me. I did listen to a bigger pockets, um, uh, or sorry, I read a, a bigger pockets blog this morning about hard money lending. So I was, I learned more there than I had in, you know, in 20 minutes than I did in the 20 plus years I've been <laughs> investing. So I, I felt more prepared coming into this, but what else am I missing Cherie that you want to let, you know, investors know about your product or hard money lending or just anything else? Uh, Well, I would say just make sure you have a plan, right? Like even if it's a flip, make sure you have a plan, especially if you have a rental, make sure that you have a plan. Uh, Make sure you have at least two up to three exit strategies um, because the market, we don't know where it's going to go at this point, especially with interest rates on the conventional side, as you mentioned earlier. 
Um, and then make sure that you are at the same, if you're going to do a rental, so if you're going to do a long-term rental, make sure that you are setting up a pre-approval with a conventional lender at the same time as your hard money loan, because you need to know that they are going to be able to give you that refi loan uh, when you're ready for it. Right. You okay. don't want to be stuck in a hard money loan. That's no fun for anybody. Right. All right. So before I let you go, um, some quick questions about central Indiana. What's your favorite restaurant here in central Indiana? Oh my gosh, that's hard. <laughs> uh, I really like public greens. It's in Yeah. Yeah. They, they uh, grow their, lo- their own local produce and they use their own local ingredients and it's so delicious. Yeah. We go there once a week. I mean, for oh. lunch. Yeah. We love it. Yeah. It's and if you walk down to bricks, the ice cream shop. Yeah. There, it's right there. And there's one in, on this, so that that location is closer to our office. There's a Public Greens um, on Mass Ave that's closer to my house. Um, so it's yeah, great restaurant. Uh, favorite bar in Indianapolis? Uh, the Inferno Room. Absolutely. You have to tell me about that. Where okay. where is that? It's in Fountain Square. It's okay. on Virginia Avenue. Um, it's like right after the overpass. Mm-hmm. And it's like a tiki bar. It's really dark and moody. And like, I'm not much of a drinker. So like they make the best mocktails of my life. Right. And their food is so good. <laughs> we, good. I definitely recommend stopping there if you yeah. have time. Yeah, we love it. We, we're not, we don't live far from Fountain Square. It's a pretty easy drive for us. And I, we don't spend enough time there. I mean, I'm sure people that listen to this or, you know, I've heard, you know, if you got into Fountain Square 10, 15 years ago, good for you. Um, it's, it's, it's an expensive place to be now. I mean, relatively speaking to what it used to be. Um, but there's so many cool little places in Fountain Square. You could just spend months there and eat at a different restaurant every weekend. It's a lot of fun stuff. So speaking of that, if you could live anywhere in Indianapolis, central Indiana and price wasn't a consideration, where would you live? Ooh, that's a good question. Let's see. Um, hmm. Probably, you know, <laughs> I, I know that I mentioned the neighborhood already, but like the Devington neighborhood is like perfectly located, you know, it's right yeah. near Meridian mm-hmm. um, and that's right near like a lot of really cool spots in Lawrence. So there's this coffee shop. Um, it's called Porter Books and Bread. It's got a spiral staircase that you have to walk down to order your like your food and your drink. And there's books everywhere. It's It's really cool. So like, I think that would be an ideal location for me because it's near parks and right. it's near like major roads. It's the quiet area. Uh, so yeah, I'd say the Devington neighborhood for sure. All right. Well, Sheree, thanks so much for joining me. It's been great chatting with you. If, if anyone wants to reach out to you, um, you'd also mention some groups that, you know, you, you hold some meetups and stuff like that. Maybe I mis- misunderstood what you were saying there, but what's the best way to connect with you to interact with you to get to know more about what you guys offer. And I guess here investing in central Indiana. Yeah, definitely email me. Um, if I don't, if you call me, and I don't answer then email me and then we can schedule a call. Um, but yeah, email is the best and yeah. That, okay. that would- All right. Well, again, thanks so much, Cherie. We, we appreciate your time and, and for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This was great. Yeah. We hope everyone picked up some information that'll help them with their investing. We'll be back next month with another podcast. In the meantime, we encourage you to share this podcast with your investing friends. Leave us a review and don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions. Until next time, thank you so much for listening and please stay invested in your investment.